Okay, welcome everyone to today's One World Mathematical Physics Seminar of IAMP. Uh, today, it is our great pleasure to have Chiara Safirio, and she's going to tell us about mean field evolution and semi classical limit of many interacting fermions. So, Chiara, please go ahead. Thank you very much um, for the introduction and for the invitation. It's, um, it's an honor to have this opportunity of presenting uh, some recent work on, on the mean field for interacting uh, uh, fermions. Uh, so the, the problem I'm interested in is the following. I will consider um, N particles uh, with Fermi statistics, so capital N interacting fermions uh, in a mean field regime. So the object I'm going to look at is um, an N particle operator that is non-positive and trace class, so it's a density matrix. And this uh, evolution is uh, given by the Liouville von Neumann equation. So you take the time derivative of, uh, of the density matrix is equal to the commutator of a certain Hamiltonian with the uh, density matrix rho n. And what this Hamiltonian is, uh, this is made of two parts, the kinetic and the uh, potential part. So for the kinetic part, we have just the, as usual, the sum of the kinetic energy of each single uh, fermion times uh, the Planck constant square. And the potential part is uh, one over n, typical of, uh, of a mean field regime, times the sum of all the interactions uh, uh, among uh, couples of uh, fermions. And for this talk, I will uh, restrict uh, uh, the dimension of the space to be equal to three. So I'm looking at the three-dimensional space, capital N fermions, in this mean field regime. So for fermions, this mean field regime is a bit special. So if you know a little bit about mean field for classical particles or for bosons, then you recognize this one over n in front of the interaction that is typical of mean field. But for fermions, because of uh, somehow energy balance or um, energy considerations that um, I will skip, but you can you can ask in the end. I can explain if it's um, if you're interested. This I mean field comes coupled with the Planck constant. So for uh, the rest of the talk, uh, the uh, the number of particle capital N is going to be linked to the Planck constant by this relation. So the Planck constant will scale with n as the number of particles to the power minus one over three, where three is the dimension of the space. So in general dimension is gonna be minus one over D. Um, so what does it mean from a physical viewpoint? I'm looking at many uh, fermions. So the number of particles is going to infinity or is supposed to be very big. And at the same time, I'm looking at big quantum numbers. So the Planck constant, uh, we are in a regime in which we can consider it to be small. So we have this um, combined mean field and semi-classical limit and uh, semi-classical because you see the H bar in, in the Liouville von Neumann equation is, plays exactly the role of the, of the Planck constant. So when you send n to infinity, this is going to zero. And the question I want to address uh, is the one of uh, deriving an effective uh, evolution equation uh, that uh, so for which for for, for n sufficiently large, uh, this system uh, is um, very much complex. So it's uh, it's actually the number of particles is so huge that it's complicated to really extract information so, for the many body system. So it's often convenient to find an approximation by means of a, um, an equation that um, is um, those in known as just one. Uh, um, is a one particle operator or a one particle function. Uh, and uh, then I want to look at this um, uh, approximation and make it rigorous. And of course, there are different levels of approximation than one can do. A first one is uh, um, I can think of taking the number of particles sufficiently big but fixed. And uh, if I do that, uh, uh, one expect to, uh, and in many cases can prove that the, this approximation is given by the Hartree-Fock equation. That is an equation for uh, a one particle operator, rho, that 
looks a bit like, uh, I mean, as a formal, like the Liouville von Neumann equation, but now is nonlinear because the one particle Hamiltonian H rho depends on, on rho itself. So this is made of the kinetic part, the interaction part that I will describe in a moment, and a term that is called the exchange term that however is gonna be subleading for the rest of the talk so we can forget about it. So about the interaction term here, so this, is, uh, um, this appears as a mean field potential, so as the uh, usual form of a convolution, typical of mean field, representing then interactions uh, of, let's say, long range, uh, but each one uh, very weak. And where you, where you see the weaknesses, so this is a convolution of the microscopic uh, uh, potential capital K with the diagonal of the operator row that I define as h bar uh, to the power three times the kernel of the operator row. That with an abuse of notation, I will use the same symbol for the kernel of the operator and the operator itself. So if you um, remember Chiara, the previous slide, yes. Um, I'm sorry, so are the particles confined in a box or confined by a potential or something? You, you so simply said now, that space is R to the cubed. Uh, no. Yes, so so actually this, this scaling comes from the fact that I initially want to confine my particles in a volume of order one with an external mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. But then when I look at the dynamics, I just uh, remove the potential and, uh, and let the particles evolve uh, in uh -huh. time. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So, um, then this h bar to the power three that we have here, if you remember the previous slide, um, this is uh, actually one over n because of the constraint. So this is really what you usually have in a mean field. So it's a one over n and then the convolution of the um, the potential with some uh, microscopic uh, macroscopic density. And the reason why I uh, want to define the diagonal of the operator with this factor here is that um, I want to look at objects of order one. So the operator row itself would be an operator of order n, but I want to rescale it in such a way that if I multiply by h bar to the power three and I take the trace of the operator, then this is something of order one. And the reason I want to do that is that there is a second level of approximation that is uh, instead, uh, I mean, maybe less uh, precise, but for applications very useful. That is instead of taking your capital N fix, big but fix, you let it go to infinity. That means at the same time, you take your semi-classical parameter to zero. Then what you expect, of, of course, is a classical um, description of, um, of your system. And this is given by the Vlasov um, equation. So the Vlasov equation is an equation now for uh, classical particles. So the unknown of the equation is a function on the phase space. So a one particle um, a density on the phase space is a function of time, space, velocity. And this time derivative is given by the Poisson bracket of uh, an Hamiltonian with uh, the function f. And this Hamiltonian, um, as two parts, the kinetic part, so it's bool squared divided by two. And again, a mean field potential that now has again the form of a convolution of the microscopic interaction potential with some density. And this density is obtained from the function f as the spatial density. So you integrate out the velocity and you get the spatial density. So it's exactly the analog of the diagonal of the operator in the R3, um, in the R3 equation. And here, if I integrate in X, so if, um, uh, so to say, take the L1 norm of this object here, this is something that is equal to one because F is a probability density on the phase space. So in, in this formulation, you clearly see that the Vlasov equation is the classical counterpart of the, of the Arthur-Fock equation. They, you, you basically just replace uh, 
the commutator with the Poisson brackets, you replace uh, the quantum, so the momentum operator square with the um, classical kinetic energy V squared divided by two, uh, and the rest is uh, basically the same. So what do we know about uh, um, rigorously about these, uh, approxi these two approximations? So the very first works uh, in the direction of obtaining uh, um, the Vlasov equation uh, from a system of n interacting fermions uh, was given by Nernot Frenzuel and by Herbert Spohn in the 80s, in which they were uh, doing a direct limit to Vlasov using um, the BBG KY hierarchy for uh, smooth potentials, and in particular in the work of Spohn for, for uh, C2 potentials. And the, the method was relying on, uh, um, on some compactness estimates. Uh, and for this reason, uh, um, the method doesn't allow for explicit, um, for explicit uh, estimates on the, on the error in the approximation. Then people realized that uh, um, actually looking at this intermediate step of the RT equation, one can do, can do better. And here I'm just selecting some results in this um, direction. So for smooth potentials, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to um, just cite uh, one of these three results. So the one by Benedict Port and Schlein, who provided for the first time an explicit rate of convergence from the many body dynamics uh, towards the uh, Hartree Fock equation. In the case of pure states, so zero temperature states, and for smooth interactions. Then we extended it together with uh, um, Yaksic uh, um, to the case of mixed states uh, for smooth interactions. But then, of course, the, 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 the big question here is, um, from a physical viewpoint, we would like uh, to know whether it's possible to take interactions that are of Coulomb type, that are the, the, most, um, the most relevant from a physical viewpoint. And in, in these directions, there have been some progresses in, uh, in recent years. So in the past, many uh, results have been obtained in different scalings with respect to the one, um, to the one I'm, I'm looking at, in which the n bar and the, the, the h bar and the n were not, um, were not coupled, uh, resulting basically in kind of derivations for time scales of order h bar. Um, here I'm now um, citing other works that are instead in the in the regime I presented in the in the very first slide that is supposed to be for time scales of order one. So for pure states uh, we know um, very little actually. So there is a, a one result that we obtained together with uh, Marcello Porta, Simone Rademacher, and Benjamin Schlein. Uh, that, however, works uh, only for a very, very special class um, of, um, of pure states. Um, they basically have to be translation invariant. So um, in, this, uh, in this work, uh, I will uh, um, focus uh, on uh, mixed states. And uh, this is uh, uh, the content of two recent works that I um, I've written together with Jackie Chong and Laurent Laflesh from the University of Texas at Austin. Okay, so then so far, I just uh, give you an overview of the state of the art uh, for uh, the approximation of the many body dynamics with the art refoc equation. But then of course, then you can ask what happens when, when you um, let the semi-classical parameter go to zero. And here, even for singular interactions, we actually know a lot. There is a huge uh, literature, uh, and everything started with a work by Lyons and Paul in 93, uh, in which they treated the uh, singular interactions, uh, but um, uh, without any explicit rate of convergence because of compactness and because of the very weak topology um, in which they could um, address the problem. Then many people have been working on, on this problem. And uh, um, a couple of years ago, together with Laurent Laflesh, uh, we provided um, 
I would say, a quite complete um, um, solution of the problem, um, taking uh, singular interactions, uh, even more, more singular than Coulomb, but say Coulomb included, that is what, what, uh, what is interesting, and providing that, in fact, you can approximate the Artrifoc equation with the Vlasov or Vlasov Poisson equation in strong norms, so in, in shutter norms, uh, with an explicit rate of convergence, so we even know what is the um, optimal rate um, of convergence. So since I would say this problem, at least in the setting of mixed states, is um, pretty much well understood, for the rest of the talk, I will focus on, on this horizontal line that is instead something that is still um, partially open. So from now on, my goal is to look at an interaction that um, has the form of an inverse power law potential. So ideally, I would like to tell you something about A equal to one, uh, and I will say a little bit, but actually you will see that uh, my result will, will not cover the whole interval I would like to, to look at. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the goal. And before stating uh, the, the, the main result, I need some notations. And uh, so um, I, I like to do this uh, classical and quantum um, comparison because this is a problem that is intrinsically semi-classical. And I, I think it, it helps a lot to, uh, to clarify uh, why we choose a certain notations or, or a certain functional uh, setting. So when one work with uh, classical particles, uh, so with classic with, with functions in on the fake space, uh, we have this natural functional setting of the Lebesgue norms, so Lebesgue spaces, and uh, from a quantum viewpoint, uh, the analog are um, um, shutter norms. However. Um, if we don't rescale it, uh, we are going to work with two objects of different sizes. So we have an object of size one here. And without uh, the rescaling in H bar, we would have an object of, uh, of order n on the, on the quantum level. So for this reason, I want to define some sort of quantum Lebesgue spaces with quantum Lebesgue norm that is nothing but the, the shutter norm of the operator, the P shutter norm. Uh, multiplied by this uh, um, scaling factor. And this scaling factor makes uh, the quantum object of order one, and therefore much easier to compare with the classical one. Then, um, so I see it's taking a while, okay. Uh, then on the classical level, uh, other very useful objects to, to look at are the derivatives of the gradients of the function on the phase space, so let's say gradient x and gradient v, that from the perspective of Poisson bracket can be written as the Poisson bracket with minus the um, velocity and the Poisson bracket with the position. And at the quantum level, in fact, you can just replace uh, the Poisson brackets uh, with the commutator and you obtain some sort of quantum gradients uh, that are just the commutator of, the, of your one particle operator with the uh, momentum operator divided by IH bar. And uh, uh, the um, commutator of the um, row with uh, the position operator divided by IH bar. So with this, um, so in this comparison, then we have objects of order one on the left hand side and of order one at the quantum level. So using this, um, it's quite natural to define the analog of a Sobol F space uh, for quantum, uh, for, for, a, for a one particle. Uh, um, density matrix. So I take this operator and I define the quantum um, Sobolev norm just by summing up the, um, the quantum LP norm, so this rescaled, uh, um, this rescaled shutter norm with the uh, quantum LP norm of the gradients weighted with some operator M that is going to be the equivalent of the velocity moment. So is just some powers of the momentum operator. Okay, so these are the notations 
uh, and now I'm um, uh, I need other two. So then we are going to work with uh, with n particles. So at the classical level, one usually look at the, the n particle um, uh, density on the phase space. At the quantum level, we have the n particle density matrix that I um, defined in the very first slide. Then one, when one wanna look at the limit for n that goes to infinity, this is not really a good object to look at. And the good object to look at are the marginals at the classical level and the one particle reduced density matrix at the quantum level. And here you have the parallel. So for classical particles, you would just integrate out um, capital N minus one particles, getting a function of only one variable. And the same happens at the quantum level. So you trace out capital N minus one particle and you get the one particle operator. So now this should be all what I need to state uh, um, the main result. So um, let's consider a solution rho of the Hartree-Fock equation with an initial datum that is, uh, I would say, semi-classically smooth. I will explain later what it means. And consider a solution of the Liouville von Neumann equation with an initial datum that those one particle reduced density matrix is somewhat close in some sense to this um, initial uh, uh, datum for the Hartree-Fock equation. Then there exists a certain time interval for which uh, in, uh, in, in trace norm, in this rescaled trace norm, the one particle reduced density matrix and the solution of the Hartree-Fock equation are closed by a factor square root, one over square root of n. So now remember that on the right-hand side, we have objects which are of order one. On the left-hand side, we get an explicit rate of convergence uh, uh, of the size one over square root of n. And this, uh, um, the dependence in time is, uh, I mean, it's pretty bad. So it, the, the error gets worse and worse as, as time increases. So, but what it's um, uh, even worse <laughs> is that uh, this parameter lambda here is independent of h bar only when the um, interaction is not too much singular. So only when the singularity is uh, one over x to the power a, where a is strictly smaller than one half. So let me comment now on the, on the result. So what I mean by semi-classically smooth. By semi-classically smooth, I, I mean that the, um, the one particle operator at time zero and its square root, they are bounded operators. Mm. And this is OK for fermions. And moreover, they belong to some uh, quantum uh, uh, sobolev space uh, that I have defined in the previous slides. And in particular, this P here, we will need it to be uh, strictly bigger than, than the dimension, so strictly bigger than three. Second remark is that um, if we are happy with uh, um, an interaction that is um, um, singular but not equal to one, so up to four over five, then one can remove this there exists a time and replace it uh, with uh, for every capital T. So for A is smaller than four over five, this is actually a global in time result, where global means on an inherent uh, time scale, of course, not for T equal to plus infinity, but for whatever capital T as big as you wish. And uh, the last uh, and maybe the most important remark uh, is that this independence on, uh, on H bar is lost uh, because um, of the method. I, I don't think it's, uh, uh, so it's clearly not, uh, not a problem coming from physics. It's just a problem of the method we use. So this is lost uh, when A is bigger or equal than one half. However, with this method, uh, we can improve, say, on, on previous results and get uh, uh, a time scale of order square root of, of h bar. So instead of the uh, h bar that was known before, and this is done really using the semi-classical uh, semi structure. Okay, so in the remaining time, um, yeah, last remark is uh, um, that in fact, I present the result in, uh, in this, uh, um, quantum L1, so in this uh, rescaled uh, um, trace norm, but actually we have the result for every 
for every rescale shutter norm, and of course, uh, the rate of convergence changes uh, depending on the on the space you look at. But this is quite um, quite general. So you can take Hilbert um, Schmidt or whatever other shutter norm you want. Okay, now in the, in the remaining time, I wanna give you an idea or better to say, uh, to show you some ingredients uh, that we uh, use in the proof. And everything relies on a very simple idea that is the fact that the, in infield theory, the potential, uh, uh, so the, the interaction comes in the form of a convolution. And so when you have a singular interaction, you can hope to absorb a part of the singularity into um, your, uh, uh, your density that in our case is the diagonal of the operator rho. Meaning that if rho is sufficiently regular or the diagonal of rho is sufficiently regular, then this could help to say, um, take care of part of the singularity of the interaction potential. And this is something that is typical of the convolution, right? So you take derivatives of this thing, you can move them all on the diagonal and you don't need to take derivatives of k. So how do we want to use this? Uh, so the, I want to give you a very simple example um, that hopefully um, helps to understand our functional setting. So um, I'm going to look first at um, what happens for classical particles. And in particular, I want to keep in mind that this uh, uh, many body evolution con converges in the end to a classical picture that is the one given by the Vlasov equation. And when you deal with uh, well posedness theory for Vlasov, uh, one object you always end up in bounding is uh, this one, in which you have a convolution in X of uh, 1 over x squared that comes from the derivative of the Coulomb potential with the uh, gradient in velocity of the solution of the Vlasov equation. And so at the level of, um, um, of functions on the phase space, uh, we have uh, a lot of um, ways of, of dealing with it. And I think the most uh, uh, elegant one is to use Lorentz spaces. Uh, so you can use a Young inequality for, uh, for Lorentz spaces to bound this one as an L1 in, uh, in velocity and L31 in X uh, um, norm of the gradient of uh, um, F with respect to the velocity. So what does it mean, this, this one? This is the, the Lorentz space and uh, um, maybe not all of you are familiar with it. So you can just um, use the fact um, that you can interpolate uh, um, this space um, with, uh, um, let's say, L3, the usual bag space, uh, minus something, and plus something, okay? So this is a very, a very, nice way, I would say, and quite elegant way of dealing with the singularity. And actually, when you look at, the, at what happens at the quantum level, you end up bounding the exact same object for operators. And the object is this one. And now I want to um, hopefully convince you that these two objects here are the same. So let's look at the commutator that is here inside and just use the property of the commutator. So we have one over x minus x uh, zero. So this is equal to one over x minus x zero, commutator over x minus x zero with rho and one, maybe I write it. So this is equal to this. So you see the, the order of the singularity is the same that we have here. And here, if we divide by IH bar, this one is exactly what I defined to be the quantum, uh, sorry, this object here is exactly what I defined to be the quantum gradient in velocity of the um, one particle operator rho. 
So now if we take uh, the, um, the trace of this, uh, of this object here, this is exactly the same um, of the classical object that I have in the line above. And then if I uh, was able to convince you with this heuristic argument that these are the same, uh, uh, the, the, this one is the quantum analog of, the, of this classical object, then the hope is that we can bound it uh, basically in the same way. And in fact, this is possible. So we gain an H bar because I'm dividing and multiplying by H bar. That is good, making this thing small. And then um, I get the diagonal of the absolute value of this operator here. Sorry, the Xi should be a V. And um, in, the, in the exact same uh, Lorentz space that again, I can, uh, bound so that I can interpolate with some um, LP uh, plus or minus uh, and this ends up into some quantum Sobolev uh, norm weighted because I'm passing from the diagonal to the operator um, of the um, operator row. So this is uh, somehow to explain why um, the functional setting that we have, I think cannot be, um, let's say, uh, we cannot improve that much on the, on the functional setting because at the classical level, we have the exact same one, okay? So this quantum Sobolev spaces seems to be really um, optimal to look at the singular interactions. Then the second ingredient is it's a, a natural consequence of that. So if this is the functional setting, then I cannot expect it to work for pure states. And why so? Because pure states uh, are not that regular, right? They are projections. Uh, on the other hand, we can make it work for mixed states because for mixed states, uh, we can expect uh, um, all the regularity that we want. But this turns out in a problem uh, at the level of the many body <laughs> dynamics because projections are actually very good when you work with, uh, uh, with many body. Um, so how do we solve it? So following um, uh, the same procedure that we introduced with, um, with Marcello, uh, Porta, Benjamin Schlein, Boykan Jaksic and uh, Nils Benedict a few years ago we um, uh, use what is called purification. So instead of looking at uh, uh, the end particle reduced, the, the end particle density matrix that can be written as uh, a linear com combination of projections uh, on, the, on the Fox space, we can uh, look at the square root of this operator. And this is uh, uh, completely um, fine because this is a non-negative operator. And if one does it, one see that this object here can be then written as a, 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 an element of the cross product of two Fox spaces. And the good news is uh, that this uh, cross product of the Fox spaces uh, is unitarily equivalent to the Fox space uh, on uh, a two copies of the Hilbert space. So it's like uh, a Fox space on an enlarged Hilbert space. And I will call this new box space uh, calligraphic G. So now on this, uh, in, in this setting, uh, one can um, basically redo or uh, reformulate all the machinery of second quantization. We can define a Bogolubov transformation that is implemented by a certain um, operator, um, capital R, that uh, acts as a rotation in the Fox space. So what it basically does, it takes the, the vacuum or a vector close to the vacuum and rotate it in a way that uh, you can look at your system from the perspective of the limiting dynamics that in our case is uh, um, the one of the R3 Fock equation. And this allows to see a lot of cancellations that uh, are extremely difficult to identify without using this tool. And on, on, of course, when I, when I say one can uh, reproduce the machinery of second quantization, one can also define a creation and annihilation operators on this uh, Fox space on the enlarged Hilbert space. 
and these are uh, defined as left and right. So you see we have two copies of L2 and uh, with the left, uh, I will uh, um, denote the creation operator that tax on the left function, so the function on the left L2, and with the right, the other one. So this was all already contained in, in, uh, in the previous work that we did with uh, uh, Benedict, Jaksic, uh, Porta, and Schlein. And so it turns out then that exactly, uh, I mean, it, it looks a little bit more complicated because of this um, structure, uh, this uh, uh, double Fox space, but one can redo the exact same thing that one um, does for, for pure states actually, mm. bounding the trace norm, in my case, the scaled one of the difference of the one particle reduced density matrix, uh, uh, and the solution of the Hartree equation by the um, expectation of the number of particle operator in the fluctuation dynamics. And what is uh, this uh, fluctuation dynamics? So this is uh, obtained by conjugating the Hamiltonian, so the, the, yeah, the generator of the Hamiltonian in second quantization with the uh, Bogolyubov transformation. So this really represents fluctuations. And uh, for mixed states, you cannot really see it um, very well. But for pure states, you can think of it as a particle all transformation, because what this the Bogolyubov transformation actually does, it creates a particle outside the, uh, the Fermi C and annihilates one inside. Now, here, this plays the exact same role, um, apart from the fact that we are dealing with mixed states. Um, but our mixed states are purified. So let's say in this double Fox space, you can think of it again as a particle hole uh, transformation. And the number of particle operator is just second quantization of uh, two copies of the identities. So the identities on the L2 uh, direct sum with the identity on the, on the second, uh, on, on the copy of L2. So this is uh, quite, um, quite standard in, in this field. So there is nothing uh, particularly new. What is new is the fact that uh, when you want to control these fluctuations here, you typically do it through a Gromwell um, type estimate. So it means you want to take the time derivative of this, uh, of this object. And when you take the time derivative of this object, it will hit uh, um, the uh, operator, the unitary operator, uh, calligraphic U. And when you hit the calligraphic oper the, the, the operator calligraphic U, you end up uh, um, having a singularity that is due to the interaction, the singular interaction that appears in the Hamiltonian. And one should uh, uh, take care of this problem. So here is... Um, basically what I said. So we have this object here to control. This is the thing that we determine the rate of convergence. We want to deal with it by um, finding a Gromwald type estimate. We perform the time derivative of this thing. Uh, that means uh, taking the time derivative of, of this operator and therefore uh, ending up having the Hamiltonian, which contains the, the singular uh, multiplication operator, capital K. So what we need to do then, if we want to apply our, um, say, the, the, the very first idea I tried to convey is to reconstruct a sort of convolution structure that comes uh, if we can see uh, a lot of cancellations in all the terms that appear in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, time derivative of this quantity in order to use the regularity of the state to deal with the singularity of the potential. And in fact, I mean, we have a lot of work and uh, uh, a lot of um, um, intermediate steps uh, defining some intermediate um, auxiliary dynamics and, uh, and a lot of technical things I don't want to uh, enter into. One can reconstruct such a convolution structure. 
But then the problem is uh, one uh, um, have then some uh, to require some regularity on the one particle operator at positive time. And the question is, can one um, assume something on the initial datum that uh, for which then this regularity holds true at positive time? So it turns out to be just a PDE problem that one has to solve. And what is really important is that this regularity has to be uniform in H bar. Otherwise, um, I mean, otherwise, clearly the time scale we can we can look at will change, right? So this is the main difficulty. If H bar would be fixed, then uh, this is a quite easy um, problem that has been addressed by many people. But when you want something uniform in H bar, this uh, this is quite hard, and this is the content of. Um, uh, uh, these two papers uh, we um, obtained uh, with Jackie and Loran. So if you have uh, an initial, uh, so this is basically just a theorem of propagation of regularity. So you don't gain anything, but you conserve the exact same regularity you assume on your initial data. So if you start um, with uh, an initial datum for the r trifoc equation that is in some quantum Sobolev space. So in particular, uh, I mean, I, I hope I convince you that this exponent three is, is kind of um, optimal and important. So we can, for instance, take an interpolation between two and four. So the three will perfectly fit by interpolation again. Then one can show that at, uh, at later times, uniformly in time, on a certain uh, bounded interval of time, the, the time evolution has the exact same uh, um, regularity. And this is all uh, uniform in H bar. So this is actually true for every, for every A. So here included the Coulomb potential. Um, Actually, if uh, uh, we stop a little bit uh, before, so at four over five, then if one assume also finiteness of quantum moments, then uh, this is global in time even. So the restriction of the one half for the time scale doesn't come from the propagation of regularity, but really comes from the many body um, part of the proof. Um, yeah, so here, this, I think it's pretty obvious. So what, what are quantum moments? So at the level of classical particles, you would just take the, um, the moment of order uh, n in V as this object here. And uh, at quantum level, you just take the trace of uh, uh, powers of the momentum operator um, applied to, um, to rho. Okay, so these were the ingredients of the of the proof, uh, and uh, I now want to comment a little bit uh, on the possibility of going uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, one alpha for um, time scales of order one. So, um, actually, for the for the technique itself, it seems. Uh, um, one can cannot really gain more by using some regularity or, or things like that at the level of the of the art equation. But maybe what one can do is uh, to ask more regularity already at the many body level and uh, look, for example, at the um, vector on the Fox space that um, somehow satisfy some sort of uh, or some analog quantum analog of RD um, relic inequality. That is basically what I've written here. So usually you would have say your, your singular interaction and uh, you can put part of it uh, in the vector on the, on the Fox space. Then the object you have to look at is something of this sort and you can hope of bounding it by some uh, um, second quantization of the Laplace. Then the problem is that to propagate uh, um, the regularity for, uh, for vectors of this form is, uh, is, uh, is very hard, but uh, maybe this could be a, a, good, uh, a good strategy. Uh, and the, excuse me, uh, what, what is the gamma sub R? 
there is uh, a yeah, yeah. This this is because it's uh, it ends up to be just the right uh, the second uh, quantization on the right space of the double fox space, but you can bound it with the second quantization of the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Um, then uh, the, the the second comment I want to make is that uh, if you look at the original problem I want to look at, and you couple this result with the uh, semi-classical limit uh, um, estimates we obtained uh, with Laurent Laflèche in 2020, you can actually close the diagram here, and uh, um, then the, the relevant uh, um, error is going to be the one coming from the semi-classical limit that is not that surprisingly. So this one would produce uh, an error of order h bar, whereas here we have a one over square root of n, and h bar um, is n to the power minus one over three. Okay. So at least for a smaller than one uh, alpha, this is uh, fully solved. Then there is one, I think, big question that stays, and this is uh, how can one deal with pure states? Uh, so I'm, I'm rather convinced that uh, this kind of approach cannot work because um, you have no hope of using regularity. And maybe shutter norms are then okay for mixed states, but are a bit too much for pure states. And especially so when the interaction is singular, of course, for smooth interactions, there, are, there is no problem. So maybe looking at weaker topologies that still allow for, uh, for explicit um, um, bounds on the, uh, on the error of the approximation uh, could be a good, uh, a good uh, a good choice, and um, I'm here referring to um, some work, uh, uh, actually a series of work by Goltz and Paul, and the first one was obtained together with Clement Moore, who uh, introduced a quantum uh, Wasserstein uh, distance, or pseudo distance, that metrize with com convergence, so it's a way weak, uh, weaker topology with respect to the one induced by shutter norms, uh, but also allows for explicit estimates, so it doesn't pass through any compactness. And um, with this, I conclude, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Chiara, for a beautiful talk. So, uh, any questions or comments <clears throat> from anybody? Okay, uh, Matt has a question, Hi. please. Yes. Um, thank you for this talk. I have a question on the first theorem that you stated. Um, after you had presented, you said that if you impose some restrictions on alpha that you have a global in time result. Is that synonymous with uniform in time? Or do you just mean that it holds over arbitrary long periods of time, but that no, the rate- No, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, so the difference is, uh, here, the difference is that when A is in between four over five and one, I can prove it only local in time. So there exists a time for which uniformly in this time interval, uh, this estimate here holds true. Whereas for A is smaller than four over five, this, there exists a time becomes for every time meaning that you can choose. So in, in, in this case, uh, for A bigger than four over five, the time is gonna depend on the initial data. So if the initial data is sufficiently small, for example, then you can have it global in time. But for A smaller than four over five, uh, for large data, you have it global in time. But the rate may still deteriorate as time of course, goes to infinity. Of Okay. So that's what I meant when I say RMFS time scale. So it doesn't mean that you can take T equal to plus infinity, of course, because uh, I'm, otherwise uh, this is gonna give you nothing on the, on the rate, but you can take T big, then you get something that is less, but in N it stays uh, um, square root, uh, one over square root of N. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? A comment. Okay, let me ask one stupid question. So you mentioned this difficulty of treating a pure state, but should we understand this difficulty as something physical? I mean, 
there is some very uh, nasty pure state and that behaves very badly or is it just mathematical uh, technical? so in my opinion this is just hmm. where we are stuck with the technique and i oh. would say that there, there are probably some cancellations that we don't see in this setting hmm. so i would say that oh. that this is a, a mathematical problem and not a physical problem so i, I do expect mm -hmm. it to, to hold in the oh. hmm. Yeah. That is because you're Maybe very close to class. So that is because you're in semi-classical regime that you expect that there's no physical difference. Well, um, yes. So uh, of course, like the, the semi-classical parameter is also mm -hmm. what creates the difficulty because mm -hmm. if we wouldn't have to um, gain some h bar on the way, uh, then this is uh, the the Coulomb case uh, is. Um, treated uh, in this work by Soren, um, no, it's, um, Petrat and Pickel, that I hope I meant, yeah, in this, uh, in this work here. Uh, but mm -hmm. since there is this coupling with the semi-classical parameter, if you forget about keeping track of h-bar, this means that you are restricting yourself on time scales of order h-bar. Hmm. So hey, yeah, the difficulty yeah. is like hmm. linking the semi-classical scaling with the singularity. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So any other questions, comments? Maybe I have one. Oh, yes, yes, please. Um, sorry, Chiara, can you tell us, uh, I, I'm not very familiar with this uh, quantum uh, Monsch Kantorovich distance, so um, has this been used to prove, um, to derive effective evolution equation for quantum so systems? Has, yeah. yeah, so it has mainly been used for the semi-classical limit, but there is one single paper, the very first one of Goldsmo and Pola, in which they use it uh, to derive uh, the R3 equation for Lipschitz uh, potential, uh, Lipschitz um, forces, okay? So very regular potentials. Um, so this was the very first uh, paper. Uh, so th there are maybe uh, things that have been improved on the way. So uh, uh, in, the, in their very first paper, um, uh, it looked like they couldn't really deal with uh, fermionic states. Uh, but um, I mean, if I, I would say that if one merges the very recent, the mo more, most recent results uh, that, that, that go So it has been used in this very first paper. Then mm -hmm. at the time, I think the setting was such that it was not clear that one could use it for fermionic states. Mm -hmm. Now I would say they they have a much more refined version and refined estimates on on this um, on this quantity on this uh, pseudo distance and on the situations in which this is actually distance, uh, for which one could probably try to, to look at it. Um, this is a guess, of course, I, I, I haven't tried, but so it sounds reasonable to get some weaker uh, convergence when you have uh, singular interactions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so any other questions or comments? If not, well, okay, so let's thank. Oh, yes. Good question Wait, about please. Bose Einstein condensation. Okay. Is there any way to describe Bose Einstein condensation as well? Or you probably need to introduce a slightly different setting? Um, so for bosons, the situation is um, is is different. So let's say in the in the mean field regime, that is the one I'm looking at. I would say that this derivation uh, to, to, to R3 is, uh, is pretty much well understood, uh, even for singular interaction. And uh, it's actually it's simpler because you don't have the coupling with the H bar. So N and H bar are two different parameters in your system. You can take N to infinity, H bar fixed, uh, you don't care, and then send H bar to zero independently. 
so this is a much um, simpler problem, even in the case of, uh, of Coulomb interaction. And at the mean field level, so at the level of the end particle, the reason is that uh, you have this nice uh, kind of um, lip tearing inequality for which one over X can be bounded by the kinetic energy. When you deal with fermions, of course, you have the same operator inequality, but this is not quite the kinetic energy for fermions. The kinetic energy for fermions comes with the H bar square in front. So you cannot use energy estimates to bound uh, the thing. And this, this is a huge problem, actually. It's a huge difference with, uh, with fermions. Then, then the gross Pitayevsky regime is a different thing, OK? And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not the expert on the topic. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Serena? so any comments from the expert? No, no, no okay, didn't want has, to do yeah, like sure. a naive, There's an expert. naive <laughs> question here. Can you also study fluctuations? Uh, I mean, for the fermions, like uh, around the semi classical behavior? So and the answer is uh, so far, no. Um, I think this is quite a difficult problem. Um, however, um, maybe with the recent techniques that Marcello with uh, Benjamin uh, Schlein, Robert Seidinger, uh, uh, Nam, and Nils uh, Benedict have introduced the bosonization. It might be possible, at least for uh, some uh, in some special setting, uh, maybe very close to a to a later determinant. I, I I'm not sure, but I uh, um, so say without uh, I would I would guess that maybe one can do something with with their method, but um, so again, it doesn't work like for for boson. So there is no. I would say there is no chance of reproducing a, mean, a, a central limit theorem uh, um, in the same way as one can do it for um, for bosons with with this okay. technique, maybe with other techniques. Is that okay? So it's certainly true. Uh, it's certainly true that there is a central limit theorem. I don't know how to prove it. Okay, so any other comments or questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank Chiara for the beautiful presentation again. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.